for being here. We welcome you, and we just are going to have a great time this morning worshiping our Heavenly Father. Let's fill this place with the praise and the admiration of the Most High God. Amen? Yeah. send you some love real quick. I've got you right here on Facebook. I just want to say good morning to you. I'm so sorry that we can't be in person, but I'm so glad to see you here online. I just want to encourage you right now, right down there at the bottom is a share button. Why don't you go ahead? You know people are home. They don't have anything else to do. Go ahead and share this video with them. Invite them to church with us. But I also want to encourage you, if this is your first time with Cornerstone today, go ahead and take a look at our information there. You can send us an email. You can call us here at the office. And we would love to pray with you. We'd love to get your information that we could give you more information about our church. But we love you. We're so happy to be here with you today. Um, I'll be looking forward to interacting with you guys on Facebook. Again, go ahead and share this video. But let's go ahead and enter in before we go back in. As we were standing here, I just... We feel the presence of the Lord here, but if we will allow it, he will absolutely fill your home with his glory and his presence. And so we're going to pray for that right now. Father, it is in Jesus' name that we come boldly before the throne. We thank you, God, that we have this opportunity to be here and gather together online. God, we ask that as we enter into a time of worship and praise, Lord, that your presence would fill each and every individual home. Lord, and as that presence falls, God, we would be able to sense you all over this valley. Father, let today be an incredibly powerful time of worship and learning. 
God, help us to build our community through the online uh, means. God, we thank you. We ask that you would anoint your message today, anoint this worship in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.
We're so thankful that you think of us, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord, that we're included, Lord, in your family and what you've done for us. Lord, we give you praise today. Lord, we join our hearts together, Lord, as we worship here and online, Lord, across this world, as we know we have friends tuning in, God, that wherever we are, that we experience your sweet spirit on another level. Holy Spirit, that you would come and pour yourself out upon us, that we would experience the peace of God. That's our prayer this morning. You know, we've been asked to join with churches from across America, across the world, in praying some specific prayers. And so we want to do that today, and you'll see some of those that are here for us. But let's pray those together, uh, just over this situation that we're all dealing with, that we would experience as God hand, God's hand in it. It says this, Father, thank you that your name is a strong tower, where the righteous can run to you and are safe. In Proverbs 18.10. We pray for those on the front lines of this response, including health officials who are working around the clock to protect us. Give them supernatural wisdom as they seek to create a vaccine and antidotes to combat this virus. We pray for, for courageous first responders in the medical field who are working for the health and safety of our communities in hospitals, clinics, and emergency rooms. We pray for you to grant wisdom to governmental leaders throughout the world on both national and local levels regarding actions to be taken to protect the citizens they serve. Your word assures us that if any person lacks wisdom, we can ask you and you will give it generously. Lord, we lift to you our concern for people who are more likely than others to become severely ill from COVID-19. The elderly and people with chronic health conditions Protect them from harm. Be their comfort in this time of uncertainty. We pray for the health and well-being of those who have already been affected by this virus. Lord, during your ministry on earth, you showed your prayer by healing people of all ages from physical, mental, and spiritual ailments. Be present now to people who need your healing touch due to COVID-19. You are a God who heals all of our diseases. Lord, please also take away the fear, anxiety, and feelings of isolation from people receiving treatment and those under quarantine. Protect their families and families who bring peace to all who love them. We pray for those who have been impacted financially from this interruption. Thank you, Lord, for supplying their needs according to your riches in glory. We pray for the faith that will not only endure through this, but will grow and lift up the name of Jesus, our savior, baptizer, healer, and soon coming king. As we remember your greatness and know that nothing is too difficult for you. We pray for a spirit of peace, that a pandemic of hope would spread globally as your people who are called by your name live out their faith in the midst of this crisis. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Thank you that you are the source of hope and that you will fill us completely with joy and peace because we trust in you. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to continue through our service today in our giving. As we continue today's worship through giving, I want to encourage you today to just allow the principles that God has taught us in his word to continue to guide and direct you. The Lord says in Malachi that we're to bring the tithe into the storehouse of the Lord. 
and we're to give offerings beyond that. This is a giving church, and you are giving people. We thank you so much for that. And during this time, we want you to know that you can give online, and you just go to our website, cornerstoneaz.org, and then go to the giving, and you will be able to bring your offering or give your offering to the church. If you don't use that format, you can put your check in the mail, or you can bring it by the church office in the following week. We want to thank you for your faithfulness during this hour. It allows us to continue to minister uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. so glad that you're with us today at Cornerstone. It's a blessing to be able to connect with you, uh, even as we're spread across the valley and across the world that are watching this stream today. I want to say thanks to our worship team who did such a great job, and to our tech team who have been serving this week and making all of this possible. So give them some love in the chat um, as they're such a key part of making this thing happen. You can always follow with us on all the avenues, cornerstoneaz.org, on Twitter, on, on uh, Instagram, YouTube, you'll find our services. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing the things that have happened. We got the news last Sunday night that all this was going to happen, and immediately we had to kind of shut service. But our, our youth worship band did such a great job in coming in and just ushering in the presence of God. And many of you have watched that video, and if you haven't, you can go back and watch it later. It's such a precious thing to just be able, be able to worship together and just experience the presence of God. And I'm thankful for them and thankful for the leaders that have invested in them to see this, uh, this next level, this next generation of people blossom and thrive. It's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, this past week was also uh, St. Patrick's Day, which I know in Protestant circles isn't really a thing that we do, but is pretty impressive because the story of St. Patrick is one where he, you know, he was, he was, in, he was in slavery, and then after coming to faith and, and being developed as a spiritual leader, goes back as a missionary to Ireland. Uh, one of the quotes that I love that, that was shared, that I, I shared this past week was this. He's, it's attributed to him. It says, Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. The idea is that Christ is in and through and all around everything that he was putting his hands to do. And that is pretty amazing. Uh, this past week, it was, uh, it's always fun, the things that we get into here at Cornerstone. Uh, we, even though the virus is doing its thing, we had to work on a roof. And so Pastor Angus was doing his best version of crawling through the roof and, uh, and dealing with all the insulation and all the craziness that was there. Uh, myself, I also ended up in the roof, and if you, if you end up in our roof, uh, you're like 30 feet or 20-something feet above the chairs, so it's a problem if you miss, so thanks be to God for his graciousness in that idea. Uh, you might have caught up with Pastor as he was sharing with us about, um, about giving online and about being those people that 
that are involved with others in letting the peace of God be upon us. You can go on our Facebook page and see that video that's there for you. Um, he was just sh sharing that we will have no services for the seeable future. Definitely this week, next week, and we're, we're kind of finding out what that will be from our government officials. But we'll have no services here at our, uh, at our location in Avondale. So that's kind of the situation. So we will be online with you uh, and being involved there. Speaking of that, I hope you got the chance to catch our kids' church, our Saturday morning kids' church that we showed yesterday that aired. I know a number of people were there. We had friends of ours from the Middle East that were watching it, people in Turkey, other places that we knew uh, that had tuned in aside from our community here across the West Valley. is pretty incredible. You definitely don't want to miss the story that's there. Uh, both uh, Pastor Cindy, Pastor Angus, Celeste, they all did a great job as well as our kids. Pastor Angus is, as Wacky Wally was amazing. So you want to make sure you go back, watch that with your kiddos. You can rewatch it with your kiddos if you didn't get a chance or if you saw it yesterday. It's, it's great. We have more of that coming this Saturday. We'll have the same thing happening Saturday morning. Kids Church will be available for your kids. Um, you know, this, new, this idea of meeting online is really not a new thing. Uh, when we lived overseas, uh, especially in Paris, I did, a, I did a community group, a life group, online every single week. Uh, we did it via Skype back then, and we didn't have Zoom and other things. So we did it via Skype because the traffic was so bad and the times of, of trying to get back and forth to your job were so terrible that we just met online. And people would, would queue in, and we would have dialogue. We'd send the notes ahead, and it was something powerful about meeting together, getting to talk with each other, even as we were in our own homes. And there were some pretty powerful things that were shared because people were transparent. People were engaging. So let me encourage you to be an encouragement to others around you, to get involved, to, to be those people that, that make a difference, because I think it really will make a difference in their life that you can be that for them. Uh, you know, uh, we had our kiddos at home and as this extra week. They already had their spring break, but then we were back with them. And it was one of those things where you know, you're spending this time, and, and actually they're pretty good troopers about it. You can see a picture of them here. It's one of those things where they actually had a pretty good attitude. I mean, what kid doesn't like to have an extra week of spring break? But, uh, of course, that is a stark reality that all their online learning is going to be start, starting this next week. And we're thankful for all those teachers and administrators that are working hard to make it happen. We know that's a lot of work. But hopefully everyone, not just our, our uh, undergrad kids, but also our, our people in university and in, in post-grad, that they would all be able to finish what they need to finish this semester. We're praying for you. One of the things that we took advantage of was being able to spend time together as a family. Hopefully you're doing the same. Um, you know, last week we talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about the golden rule and doing unto others. My family likes to talk a lot of smack. So they were talking smack about how they were going to win at Uno, and I was just quiet. And then I won, and I beat them, and I gloated, and I shared it on the internet, which I'm not sure is the right response, but <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, we're continuing today in our, in our talk, in our series about the red letters. And the red letters is a, is a series that we've been talking about using the words of Jesus, which in print copies of your Bible, you'll actually many times will be in red, using the words of Jesus as a starting off point, talking about who he is. So we ask that question, who is Jesus? We've talked about it and how he is very much our Messiah He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's all those things. So as we see that, that idea of who he is, we see him in stained glass. We see that imagery of Jesus. It's something that's powerful. It is who we see Jesus as. But when he was here on earth, he, he didn't have this, this, uh, this grandiose idea around him. People obviously recognized that in him, but he actually himself was very humble. He actually was one that would go and connect with a person like the woman at the well, go out of his way to share with her the peace that she needed. He's someone who, who modeled what it meant to be a servant leader. He actually knelt down and washed the muck, the mire, the dirt, the grime off of the disciples' feet. He showed them what it meant to be a servant, what it meant to lead others as a servant and having a servant's heart. Man, it was powerful. And that's why when we use this image of walking with Jesus, that's who we are. We're people that are not done yet. We're on a journey with Christ. Uh, we know that if you ever think that you've arrived as a Christian or in your faith with God, good luck. Because Jesus is still going. He's continuing forward as we develop in our character more like Jesus. 
So my encouragement to you is that you're never done. Continue in your relationship with Christ. Uh, so the red letters today, we're going to do a real, real quick recap before we jump in. You know, born again, uh, Pastor uh, Rich started out a few weeks ago talking about being born again. He talked about it in Matthew 28, where Jesus is talking there and talking about some of those things about what it means to be born again. He also talked about it in John 3, where he's revealing that you need to be born again. And those, those key scriptures that we see that are so important to us, where Jesus says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that's our hope. That's what we're so thankful for. Not that just Jesus came and was an example, but that Jesus came as a sacrifice for us. He took our place. He took on the sin of mankind and paid for it on the cross. That he didn't stay dead, but he rose again and is back with the Father. So as we, we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, it's in these scriptures, it's in these core things that Jesus says, we believe Jesus for who he is. That's what our faith is based on. You know, people can say, you know, you believe this, well, I believe this. Well, actually, I believe Jesus. That's the difference. And so if you believe Jesus in what he says, yes or no, that's really what it means to be a Christ follower. We talked about also the golden rule and forgiveness. That was a really easy week, right? Uh, the idea of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, you know, we, didn't, we weren't really sure what that was going to be, but that was right at the start of this virus onset where people started to act crazy and hoard toilet paper and, and hand sanitizer and everything else. And people were starting to act out because they were afraid. And so we started talking about how we would, we would treat others the way we want to be treated, that we would forgive and not hold that, that grudge, that instead we were forgive just as we had been forgiven. We see that in scripture, talking about that we would not judge not, so that we would not be judged in that way. Um, last week, we actually talked about how you have value, so therefore do not be anxious. It's, it's difficult because we know everything that's going on around us, and you know, we, we're, we're afraid. But God talks to us about, listen, this value you have, it's great. He's talking about how, listen, sparrows, they're almost worth nothing in the common market, the way we buy and sell. But God values them, and he values you even more. He knows everything about you, the hairs on your head, your circumstances you're going through. You have value. At the same time, he also talks about do not be anxious. It says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. See, it's something that's so imperative to us that we do not shrink back in fear, but that we stand in faith and in wisdom, and we do not let that fear and that anxiety take control of us. Today, we're continuing in that Red Letter series, and I wanted to kind of kick this off talking about something that I was going through this past week. You know, we see this virus, and it's literally everywhere in our social media. It's everything we see. It's on all the news outlets. It's on everything that you go on social media for. Everyone's talking about it in one way or another because it's affected everyone's life. And at the same time, we can be those people that it starts to become fear in our lives. Like when I'm writing that message about anxiety, I'm not writing it to you. I'm writing it to us. And it's one of those things where, you know, fear starts to creep in. And I, it was kind of a thing because I started taking a moment and just calming down in my quiet time with Jesus and start thinking about these things that would, be a, that would bring fear to my life. See, naturally, I'm not a very fearful person. Um, you know, when I was young, I, I remember I moved to Mexico just to go be a part of church planting that was there. Uh, we were, we, we was kind of ridiculous. You can see an image of it here. Um, I wasn't afraid to have that haircut, which that says something. But, uh, you know, it, I could actually have a tan back then, too, which was a whole other issue. Uh, I wasn't afraid of those kind of things. You know, I grew up kind of doing extreme sports and, did, you know, all the things like that. This is a picture of me a few years ago with some of our, our Chi Alpha guys and Discovery Church guys out of Prescott uh, climbing, rappelling the Granite Dells there in Prescott. Man, just amazing. Like, I, I've always not had that natural fear. It's been something where... God's given me the courage and the boldness to try these things, and that's why we're able to go and live abroad and, and go and, and be missionary church planners across the world. 
But at the same time, all of us are susceptible to fear because it's things that we cannot control that really make us fearful. I, I know a few, a few moments, some of them are funny, some of them are not, that really kind of struck a little bit of fear into me. One of the first moments was whenever my daughter Shiloh started looking at me like this. You know, I knew I was in trouble, man, and I knew I had a lot of years ahead of me because I was like, oh, no, this is a problem because I want to give her all the things that she asks for. <laughs> and I was afraid. I'm like, how do I take care of this one? How do I make her be not spoiled and turn out well? And by the grace of God and a lot of help from her mother, she is a great kid. Uh, you know, I was thinking about when we first moved to France, we would be there in the city, and they, we talked about it last week. They'd have strikes and all this stuff, and man, you're just hoarded with other people. And I was thinking about moving there from living out here in the West Valley where you drive everywhere to living in this, this urban city with millions of people and how to navigate everything, how, how to go from place to place. There was this, this feeling of, man, I have never done this. I, I felt like, you know, I can't really change what's going on here. But in the midst of all that, it was God gave us peace. Yeah, I kind of felt like it was the running of the bulls, except it's people who will not stop even if you fall down. So God give us grace. You know, whenever we had our daughter Amelia, it was the same kind of thing, but for a whole nother reason. It, it seemed like, you know, I wasn't going to win any conversation or get this child to smile at all. But thankfully, she, uh, she really turned a corner on that one. It's actually very sweet now. Uh, you know, when we came back from Europe, we, we, we were sure that God had been speaking to our heart about going back out into, into missionary church planning work. And it's, it's a scary thing if you've done it once, but once you do it with several kids and you pack up all the things that you, that you own and you put, it, you put it into these blue bins, that's everything we had. We had getting, gotten rid of everything else, like no furniture, nothing else. That's what we shipped across the world to start a life in the Middle East. It was a little bit daunting. When we first landed in Cairo, I remember even though it was the middle of the night, there were crowds everywhere. And it's this massive sprawling city. And so even as we landed, people are bombarding you, trying to get you to, to take their services or you know whatever. And I didn't speak Arabic. And I'm, I'm like, you know, just looking at them wide eyed and trying to navigate. And in the, even in the days to come, as we kind of got more settled in, in Cairo, it was one of those things where, how do I navigate this massive city of all these people? People do not speak English. Like, I, I, my Arabic was poor. And, and I'm trying to think about how to get home whenever, whenever I get lost. It, it becomes a fearful thing. But you can't stay in that fear. You have to press through it and walk in the grace of God. I remember when Sarah, one of our Arabic teachers, was, was working into um, all, of our, all of our Arabic to move into words and putting it together with the correct pronunciation. And she expected us to understand it so quickly because it came so fast to her. And man, it, there's a thing about being out of your element that makes you fearful. Like, how do I do this? How am I going to be able to ever speak this language? But thanks be to God, we were able to progress and see some things happen. Last week, we talked about this scripture and brought it up. It's in 2 Timothy 1, 7. And I wanted to bring it back up to us today. It says this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So if we deal with those fears, then we can focus on these moments that bring us joy. Uh, you know, thinking about this, this past week, we got into a conversation about all sorts of stuff, and I was messaging with different friends, and I, came, I went back through some of my older pictures from Instagram and pulled up some gems that really gave me joy. One is my friend Kyle. Uh, Kyle is a quiet guy, but Qu Kyle can be so funny and goofy. And back in the day, we would film all of these videos where Kyle was the key component. He was the goofy, ridiculous person. He was a box of issues. He was a dancing Christmas tree. No matter what video he was in, he made me laugh. Even today, thinking about it makes me laugh. This is an image of him winning a, an ugly sweater contest because why wouldn't he win it? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's incredible. And it's those kind of things that just give you joy when you start thinking about these great moments that highlights even of everyday stuff that bring you joy in your life. I remember when my friend Stacy and my friend Aaron, when they first started dating or talking to each other, I was their youth pastor and they had kind of grown up out of that and, and into that next phase of life. And they were both great people that loved Jesus. And then they started to really like each other. And man, there was something about that because it wasn't, 
uh, sketchy. It wasn't suspect. It, it felt very right because God was in their life and they were doing their relationship correctly. Man, it gave me such joy. Today, they're married, they've got several kids that are awesome and they're doing great. And I'm thankful for them as friends, thankful for what that is and God has continued to do through their life and their abilities. I remember thinking uh, on this moment and saw this picture, it gave me such joy of my parents visiting us when we lived in France. We had, we had kind of put together our whole, our whole living room and bought this amazing yellow leather couch from a secondhand place, which today I've never seen another yellow leather couch. So I, I wish I could have kept it. But my parents came and you know, when you have kids, sometimes kids can be different. You know, they're not around your parents a lot. They, would they treat them like, like strangers? Like how would they be? But man, Javen and Shiloh, with the time she was a little baby, but they were so warm to my parents and they immediately connected right with them. And my dad was, was just having fun with Javen being silly and they were being like pirates or something and they were swashbuckling with foam swords there in the, in the house. And it was such a warm uh, remembrance and memory for me. We would church plant and as we were church planters in Paris, helping start the Bridge International Church, we would be those people that we had to pack our gear every single week. And we'd pack our gear in and out of the van. So every time that we did it correctly and followed the plan and it fit perfect, like, like Jenga or Tetris, man, it felt so good. It's that moment where you're like, yes, nothing's left out of the van. Everything fit. Thanks be to God. The Lord be praised. Now, we were pretty broke when we lived in, in, uh, in Europe. I mean, you would be. The euro at that time was $1.35 to $1.61. So you're talking about really, really difficult. So it's one of those things where, you know, we didn't have a lot. But the small things, the simple things like an espresso for one euro, man, that made all the difference. I was really thankful for that. Uh, and all my coffee lovers out there can say amen. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those things, too, that was great. You know, uh, we were visiting Versailles, which is this massive castle from Louis XIV. And, and it's, you think about the, this massive thing that he set up and built. And Celeste, she takes a moment to fix her, fix her makeup in these uh, grandiose mirrors that the king set up to make a reflection of himself. And it made me just laugh because she's just taking advantage of this mirror, like another mirror, you know. Everyone else is taking pictures of the, of the ceiling and all the ornamental stuff. And she's just like, I'm just going to touch it up real quick. I thought it was amazing. It was such a great thing. Um, as we would take photos, we had a, a life group that would take photos in Paris. We would venture out even when it was raining because it's Paris. It's going to rain. But we would venture out when it's raining, and we would take these amazing photos, like this one of the Louvre, where the, you know, it's this, the, the lights are coming out of the building, and the rain is there with the reflection. And man, it's just such a cool vibe to be there. And to be there with friends from church, and to share faith, and talk about what's going on in our lives, it was so powerful. It was that joyous kind of occasion. When we moved back from France, um, there was these trees that my father and my brother and I had planted in the backyard of my parents' house. We planted them when I was 12 or maybe turning 13. And today they're these massive trees. And when my son came back from living abroad, we, had, we hung this rope swing in one of the trees. And a tree that my father and I planted, now my son was able to play in. It was like the giving tree or something. It was just such an amazing moment. I think about it often. It's the, those moments like whenever I was in Morocco and Chef Shawan, and, and you have the sunrise come up over the city, the blue city, and it's that, that luminescent light that's there, doing my quiet time with Jesus, just thanking God for what he's doing in and through that country. My friend Chris and their great church, their international church that's there in Casablanca and Marrakesh and Tangier and, and all that God is doing, it was such a great moment. I think about them often and pray for them. You know, it's uh, that sunset over Cairo. We were at the top of a building with our team building for Live Dead. And, and we were there praying together as a collective and looking out as the sun faded. It was such a powerful moment. It was one of those things that was, you can't replicate. It was just a powerful thing to be praying with others and seeing God paint the sky over an amazing city of millions of people. It's like when we lived in Alex and we would be at the top of these buildings looking out over the Corniche, over this, uh, this busy thoroughfare along the sea and just seeing all of the traffic go back and forth with all the lights. And it was just this amazing thing that God had given us that opportunity to be light in that city. It was powerful. 
It was amazing. It's like being in a small group, like my friends that were here where every single person was from a different country and all of us together were sharing those stories about what we had in common and differences in our culture. But God had knit us together because we all belong to his kingdom. It's an amazing thing. It's all these small moments that we can give God praise because the joy we experience from it. So don't be downtrodden, don't be full of fear. Take a moment, reflect, and thank God for those joyous moments that he's given you because there are more to come. There are greater days ahead still. Today we wanna talk for a few minutes about this idea of salt and light. If you have your Bible, your tablet, your phone, wherever you are, you can look it up. It's in Matthew 5. It says this in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Verse 14, for you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a lamp on Uh, Put a light in a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Lord, we pray over your word today that would illuminate our hearts. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, one of the things about having lived abroad uh, and traveled abroad um, a a bit is this idea that we get to see the expansion of early Christendom. Uh, One of the cool things about living in a key city like Alexandria is that we would have these Christian artifacts that went back to the early church in like the year 300 when they brought these stones, not just from local quarries, even though they have amazing quarries in Egypt, but they actually brought this white marble across from Greece to build these places. And it's, it's kind of an amazing feat if you think about it. So as you look at that ancient world there in the Mediterranean, that's where the gospel was first going forward. That's what where first all these things, that's the setting for it. It's the Middle East, it's there in Jerusalem and Israel and all throughout that region as church planning began to happen at the hands of Paul and his associates and others. So as we're talking about these things and we're putting into context this idea of salt, it's in this ancient world where salt was so very valuable. You think about salt, and as it talks about it, it says, you are the salt of the earth. Well, that doesn't mean much to us today. We can find salt at every restaurant. You can get it in these little packets to go, and people don't really think about salt having much value. I grew up right here by a, a, by a salt manufacturer of Morton out here in the West Valley. Uh, I had a friend one time. She didn't know what that was, those big mounds of salt that they mine out of the water there. And she's like, well, what is that? And another friend told her that it was a snow cone factory where they made ice. She's like, well, isn't it too hot for the snow cones to stay ice? And he's like, no, there's so much it stays cold. And she believed that for years. So there's that. Um, back to salt. Salt is so valuable. It's one of those things that, you know, especially in, in, in even today, we, we salt and pepper. We, we add the flavor to our food. But in historic ancient time, it was a thing that preserved food. It was the thing that people fought wars over. In fact, as you look at it, the value is so great, it's almost incomparable. It was more valuable than gold in many places. Uh, You think about a handful of salt, that's one of these things that they would fight battles over because it was so valuable to preserve it. In fact, all of the things that we see today with all the exploration of the world that happened by ship, that could never have happened without salt. And as we think about it, and we would salt fish, and they salt all those things. Even today, they do that same thing. In ancient, the ancient days, there's all these salt trade routes that would happen, especially across Italy. And a lot of battles were fought over this very thing because they would have salt mines, and then they would go and they would fight these battles. There were whole cities, that ancient cities, that were built upon this concept. You can see a picture of one of them here. It's, it's these things that, that's what gave them value, is it was a salt trade city. And you think about it today, we we don't think about it that way, but Jesus is talking about it for you and for me. He's saying that you are salt. You are this valuable thing that is so precious that people would fight over it. But here's the thing. If, If you lose your saltiness, if you lose the very effect of what makes you valuable, then that thing is, is, is easily thrown away. It's easily put aside. And 
it, it, it's a kind of an interesting thing. It says in Luke 14, a different place, salt is good, but it's, if it's lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's of no use either for the soil or the manure pile. That's rough. You know, one says throw underfoot. This one's saying you can't even put it in the manure because it's going to make that thing not worth anything either. Man, that's, that's tough. We see in a different place, Leviticus actually talks about how they would use salt in with their offerings. It says, you shall season all of your grain offerings with salt. This is the Lord giving this as, as to them so they can make the correct offering. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So even in that day, he's saying, listen, this valuable thing that you have, you have to offer that. It's, it's one of those things that is expected. You know, we see grain and we don't think about it that way, but it's even within all of those rites that we would see in the Passover and other meals. The grain offering that's there was actually pretty specific. It's, they would give this gift to God and they would actually have it and put it upon the bronze altar. It would be this thing, this grain offering that's there for the Lord. And we would have these combinations of oil with flour or grain and some kind of a frankincense like, like that we would see that was brought to Jesus whenever he was first, uh, first born. We see that same idea here as one of the elements for the sacrifice. And even unleavened bread, it would be there with no yeast to make it rise, but instead with salt. So that's when Jesus is making these parallels. He's talking about something that they very much know. They're expected to have it to make the correct offering. So Jesus is talking to them about salt. He's saying, listen, if you are valued this way and that's how God sees you, then remain with that saltiness. Remain with the character of God. Don't let it slide out of your heart. Don't act different. Don't be thrown aside by what God has for you. In the same way, it talks about light. Now, light is an interesting thing. Um, all of us, we're, we, man, we just gravitate to the lights. Uh, you know, for me, uh, some of the most amazing cities I've ever been in are places like Hong Kong, where the light show they have and the laser lights at New Year's and other times are just incredible. Places like um, Tokyo and Japan, where, man, all these lights are just incredible. As you walk down the place, it's every single place is lit up with all these cool lights. It's amazing. And, and even if you look at a light map of the world today, you see how much of the world is, the light comes from those major, major cities. And all the other places have less people in them. Wherever there are people, there is light. So as he's talking about this idea, he's talking to us about being this light. And it's something simple. It's not something grandiose. Obviously, they didn't have any of those things in that day. They had something simple. They had the oil and the light. And so he's talking to us about being that thing, being the light for others. It says in scripture, you are the light of the world, a city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. And he's talking about how, listen, people don't hide the light that's there. Instead, they actually lift the light up so other people can see. If you have a light low, it's not going to give up the same luminescence as if you lift it up and it can actually spread in a room. So he's saying, you know, you, gotta, you wanna let your light shine. There's a classic story, you know, you don't hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. That's the old kids song that's there, right? And so you guys can sing it at home with your kids or let it rumble around in your head this next week. But it's this, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And so now it's an earworm for you for this week. But it's great because that's what we want to be. We want to be that light that shines to others. You know, it's a pretty dark time right now. And so Christ is talking to us about being salty, being the one who has the character of God and letting our light shine for him. You know, uh, living in Alexandria, it was known for years and years for the famous ancient wonder of the world, which was the lighthouse of Alexandria. It gave light to everyone around. And the Mediterranean was known for ships sinking and all these things, especially as trade went across throughout the world and the Mediterranean there. And the lighthouse of Alexandria was a place of safety. It was a place that people would look to because they could see the light from afar off. And they knew it was a safe harbor. That's what God has called you and me to do, to be that kind of light, to let our light shine. Not that we're the one that's the source of the light, Jesus is the source of the light, but that in and through us, that we, the other people can be drawn to him in the safety of Christ. 
It says in scripture in John 1, 1, it begins this way. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, talking about Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome overcome it. The light shines in the darkness. See, in these dark times, as we talked about, Jesus is shining in the darkness. He is still hope. He is still peace. He is still love. He is still joy. He's still with you. And you can be that same thing to those around you. You can be that expression to those around you. It says this in John 12, Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me me, believes not in in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. It says, but if anyone hears my words and does not keep him, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. You know, we talk about what it means to be a Christ follower. We use that imagery all the time. For us, it means to be a salt and to be light. It means for us to be that example of who Jesus is, to be filled up by him and not to be in full of anxiety, not to let these things come and stress us and press us in. Do we have to take care of things? Of course we do. Do we have to use wisdom? Of course we do. But in the midst of it, do not let it bombard you. Be salt, be light, be different than that. You know, the question that we have to ask every single week is something that's so important because it's exactly how we've embraced Christ. And that question is, have you embraced Jesus? You know, every single one of us that calls ourselves a Christ follower, a Christian, is, has made that decision to follow Christ. We read these words of Jesus and we saw exactly what he did as he came to earth. We read the scripture and we believed that he came and he lived a sinless life and he became He became a sacrifice for us where we could not earn the grace of a holy God. He became a holy sacrifice for a holy God. And he bridged the gap so that all of us could be forgiven of our sin. If that's you today, let me encourage you to make that decision, to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Paul writes, and he says this to the church in Rome, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be forgiven saved. And with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. So let me encourage you that you would make that decision today. Place your face and trust in Jesus Christ, that your faith would become alive as he becomes your savior and your Lord. And it changes your life because he's the hope that you've been looking for. Let me pray for all of us today that we would go and be um, be everything that God's asked for us to be. I'm gonna ask Heidi if you'd come. If that's you today and you've had anxiety, you've had stress, you've been full of fear, let me encourage you instead to sit and reflect on the joy that God has brought you in your life, that you would be salt, that you would be light, that you would allow the peace of God to go and move in and through your life that it would be something that would change you for this week to come, that people would make a notice and they would note how you are different than others around you because you have the peace and the love of God flowing in and through your life by his spirit. Let's pray over that today. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your words. We thank you, Lord, that you are God who does not leave us alone. Lord, you are with us. Lord, you place such a high value on us. Lord, you call us salt. You call us that thing that's worth value that people fight for. Lord, you give us that kind of importance. And Lord, not just that, but you also say, don't lose that value, but Lord, stay with you. And that's exactly what we want to do. Lord, that we wanna be light. We wanna be the light that you brought into the world because Lord, Darkness can over, cannot overtake the light. So Lord, we wanna be full of who you are. Lord, fill us with your spirit, fill us with your love, with your peace, with your joy. Lord, that in the midst of all this chaos, calamity, fear, that we can walk full of the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord will be our strength. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these things. 
We pray, Lord, that we would, we would be changed this next week to come. Lord, that we would rely on you. Lord, we wouldn't run from you. We would run to you. Lord, and for those who made a decision today, Lord, we rejoice with them because their life is changed. Their life is different because they've embraced you. They've experienced the forgiveness, the love, and the joy they've been looking for. Lord, and we celebrate that. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Before we go, I just want to tell you we have more things coming for you this week. Uh, you can follow us on all of our social programs and platforms. Uh, you can find uh, more of our worship services going to be happening online. So make sure you tune in there. You can get our email that comes to you as well. And, and, and just follow us on all these different things so that you can be a part of what God is doing. Be a part of our kids' church and, and all the fun things that are going to happen in the days ahead. Let me pray this blessing over us before we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, I pray a blessing upon your church, your people. Lord, you would empower us with your love so we can be salt and light to those around us. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know this, we love you very much here at Cornerstone. God bless you. Have a great week.